It is my pleasure to open this working session number nine, uh, which is a continuation on the specifically selected topic on violence against women and children. This afternoon session is dedicated to women belonging to vulnerable groups. Any form of violence is unacceptable. Violence against women belonging to vulnerable groups is particularly wrong and damaging, as it is an expression of double discrimination and our societies should have zero tolerance for perpetrators of such injustice. What exactly do we mean by vulnerable and marginalized? Girls and some groups of women face violence because they are simply women and belong to minority groups. Indigenous women, refugee and internally displaced women, migrant women, women living in rural or remote communities, destitute women, women in institutions or in detention, women with disabilities, elderly women, widows, women in situations of armed conflict, and women who are otherwise discriminated against, including on the basis of HIV AIDS. They are all in need of protection and their needs must be addressed because they are the, tar the target and unwanted other in more ways than one. In addition, OSE participating states recognize that Roma and Sinti women and girls are particularly vulnerable to multiple forms of discrimination, as well as to violence and harassment, as evidenced last year with the adoption of a ministerial council decision on the topic. Vulnerability <laughs> also comes from being a woman and being caught in struggles of a conflict within states or among states, which has nothing to do with them and which they more than likely did not initiate, since women are often missing from high-level decision-making. UN Security Council resolution then, <clears throat> number 1325, on women, peace, and security, calls for special measures to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, particularly rape and other forms of sexual abuse, and all other forms of violence in situations of armed conflict. Subsequent resolutions in this vein stress the need for such measures because time and time again, women's needs during and post-conflict conflict remain unaddressed. Despite the efforts of OSCE participating states to provide legal and policy frameworks for gender equality and the protection of women's rights, experiencing multiple forms of discrimination women from vulnerable groups face increased exposure to trafficking and sexual violence domestic violence and reproductive violence including forced sterilization this has also been underlined at the recent ose gender equality review conference by one panelist from civil society a romani woman who said quote what is difficult for all women, especially the ones belonging to the vulnerable groups, is to recognize and open up as a victim of violence. The forms of violence encountered by Roma and Sinti women vary from racially motivated attacks, sterilization, forced evictions to forced marriages, domestic violence, and trafficking." End quote. Women from vulnerable groups are also <clears throat> also experience hate crimes and other forms of intolerance, as well as instances of the disproportionate exercise of police powers and force. Successive ODIR annual hate crime reports demonstrate that women are being targeted in a range of instances, from threats to violent attacks, and highlight that racist or religious bias often intersects with gender bias. Such violence against women belonging to vulnerable groups minority groups, Roma and Sinti, refugee and IDP women, migrant women, or women wearing the veil or other religious symbols, points to deep, persistent, and systematic stereotypes and discrimination that needs to be stopped. I urge participating state and civil society representatives here today to prioritize efforts to prevent and combat violence against women from vulnerable groups, including by increasing public awareness and enhancing dialogue ensuring adequate support and rehabilitation mechanisms for victims of violence, including protection and support to women and girl children who experienced violence in conflict or have become victims of trafficking in human beings, firmly prosecuting perpetrators, as well as exchanging and coordinating information among governments, the vulnerable groups themselves, and civil society. 
I urge the OSC participating states to strengthen their efforts in effectively preventing, investigating and punishing the perpetrators of such violence, as well as in protecting victims. These horrific violations of a woman's body, soul and dignity shall not be tolerated in the OSC participating states or elsewhere for that matter. After these initial remarks, I would like to proudly present you our two introducers uh, this afternoon. Immediately to my right, Ms. Soraya Post, member of the European Parliament of Sweden, um, on behalf of Sweden. In the election of 25th May 2014, Soraya Post became the European Union Parliament's first elected member of the Swedish Feminist Initiative, as well as the first Romani women in Swedish history to be chosen as a candidate for a political party. She has joined the group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament, and she is member of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and the Subcommittee on Human Rights, as well as substitute member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Delegation for Relations with the Countries of Central America. We also have with us Dr. Gemma Hasratian, President of the Association of Women with University Education, is the Director of the Gender Studies Center in Armenia. Dr. Hasratian is the President of the Armenian Association of Women with University Education and the Director of the Center for Gender Studies. She holds a PhD in Education. Ms. Hasratian is the leading expert on gender equality and women's rights in Armenia. She has led efforts to advance women's rights in Armenia, including activities to increase women's political participation, as well as to prevent and combat domestic violence or violence against women belonging to vulnerable groups. A committed activist, Ms. Azreaton, testified uh, before the CEDAW Committee and has cooperated with the UN Council of Europe and the OSCE. Her organization also published an analytical survey on women's political participation in the 2012 parliamentary elections in Armenia. She was one of the 1,000 women proposed for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. And it is also my pleasure this afternoon to moderate this session, so I'm not introducing any moderator now. But before I give the floor to uh, our um, speakers, just a few reminders. You have heard this already many times this week. The speakers list is um, still open uh, behind me, so those who would like to take the floor afterwards, please let our colleagues uh, sitting behind us know. Uh, for the time being, it's not a very long list, uh, so in principle, we will be having around five minutes uh, for, each, um, for each speaker. And as usual, I would like to, before taking the floor, you introduce yourselves and the delegation or the organization that you are speaking on behalf of. Keep your comments brief and to the point. Try to not read um, statements that can be circulated through the document distribution system and concentrate on recommendations um, and, and constructive criticism. With this, I would like now to invite our first speaker this afternoon to address uh, this very important issue. So, Ms. Soraya Post, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I would also like to uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me the pleasure to be here in Warsaw at uh, this meeting. I recognized an hour ago, it is nine years since I was here attending these kind of meetings. I thought it was like three, four. So the time is running away. You know? Yeah, it's running very fast. Um, and I hope also that you will all be very active in this discussion because it is a very important issue. I will speak as a Roma woman, first of all, and also a, firm, a former activist in uh, human rights issues and Roma women issues. And uh, I would look forward to have a, a great discussion because it is a really important issue to discuss now at this time as we are facing now. So in Sweden, we have seen what we call the feminist spring, preceding to, to the EU elections in May. The feministic initiative, the party that I am representing in the European Parliament, grew very quickly to 20,000 members. 
and we see more and more people raising the urgency of forwarding issues of gender equality and human rights in politics. Freedom from violence and discrimination are cornerstones in a democratic society. A real democracy has to be founded in human rights value. The Feminist Initiative Party chose to put me, Roma woman, as a top candidate to run for the European parliamentary elections. We won with 5.5% and had one seat, the first feministic political party ever in a parliament. And uh, I am the first Roma woman in Swedish history to be chosen as a candidate for a political party. Roma have been in Sweden for 500 years. So we have a, a long history in Sweden but have also been very invisible. Half of the party's top 20 candidates for the national parliamentary elections are women with migrant background. The same month as I was elected to the European Parliament, the Swedish government came out with a white paper on discrimination and abuse against Roma during the 20th century in Sweden. Unfortunately, this history has not ended. Last year, it was revealed that the Swedish police had kept register of Roma. 5,000 persons, newborn children, dead people, and I was one of them who was registered, together with my children and my grandchildren. I have never been accused for a crime in Sweden. However, I was registered. And we have seen also the eviction of Roma camps by local authorities without offering alternative housing. This institutional violence has implications for Roma women subjected to domestic violence since they will not expect any help or support from local or state authorities. The topic of this uh, workshop is violence against women belonging to vulnerable groups. However, we need to stop talking about vulnerable groups and instead talk about what puts women in vulnerable positions. Violence against women is not the root, but only a symptom of a system that distributes resources and power and equality according to gender, race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, etc. Hence, it creates a situation of multiplied discrimination for women with minority background, LGBT women, women with disabilities, or women that in other ways do not comply with the norms of the society. Violence is the most extreme expression of this unequal system of power distribution. Roma women and women of other minority background are subjected to several forms of violence. However, to combat this violence, we need to go to the roots of the problem, to the structures shaping everyday life. I will give you some examples. The lack of accessibility, accessible and affordable housing, and especially for women who have children to support makes it difficult for women to leave abusive relationships. Hence, housing policy is an important area to focus in combating violence against willing, as well as economic independence. Multiply discrimination in the labor market, the lack of decent salaries, precarious forms of employment, and lack of employment, allows for violence against Roma women. Migrant women and minority women have the lowest salaries, more precarious form of employment, and inferior working conditions. Unemployment rates for Roma women are higher than both the unemployment rates for Roma men and the un unemployment rate for non-Roma women in Europe. It is crucial that states improve the possibility for economic independence for minority women including single mothers, LGBT women, disabled women, etc. if they are going to succeed in putting an end to violence against women. Institutional racism and discrimination from state authorities. Roma women, 
and other minority women have a long history of experience of discrimination and violence from state authorities. In healthcare, Romani women have been subjected to forced sterilization. So did my mother. I was born, and then I had a brother. And when she was pregnant for the third time, they made a forced abortion in seven months of pregnancy and sterilized her. She was 21. And refusal to give medical checkups by doctors. This means women who face domestic violence rarely expect or seek the support and help they are entitled to from state authorities. And when they do, they face additional obstacles in accessing protection, combating anti-gypsies and multiple discrimination within the legal system. Police authority as well as healthcare and social service is therefore crucial. When discussing violence against minority women, we need to focus on the structures that keep women in abusive situations. Violence against women is the responsibility of the society and a central issue for politics. It is, all, it is also the responsibility of the state to support victims of violence through, for example, to ensure gov and, uh, government to ensure core funding for women shelters. There are several women trying to get help in uh, existing women shelters, but are denied because they are Roma. So I'm not in favor for segregated women shelters, but there is a need for women shelters, crucial, and also to have the knowledge how to meet other cultures. Expertise units in hate crimes within the police accessible to all citizens. Increase legal security through awareness raising and educating the legal system on violence against women so that perpetrators can be brought to justice. We need more funding for women's organi organizing, and, it is, and it's not just putting out money there, but giving the tools for administration, seriously working to have women run their own organizations. Also, seriously acknowledging and using the expertise of these organi organizations in policy making. Because of anti-gypsies, and exclusion from basic fundamental rights like housing, healthcare, employment, Roma women run a higher risk of being exposed to trafficking. ILO estimates that 80% of all people subjected to human traf trafficking are women and children. 98% of everyone subjected to sexual trafficking are women. This is a growing slave business that we can end, not by strict immigration policies, but by opening up our nations and Europe. Strict visa regulations reinforce the imbalance of power between states and allows for human explo exploitation. Yeah. Higher barriers and close border lead to increased trafficking and a growing global sex industry. Today, undocumented women are afraid to report rape, violence, and abuse to the police or state authorities of fear of being deported. States today give higher priority to protecting the borders than protecting women from violence and trafficking. Current migration policies create the vulnerable situation for many women. States can reduce the vulnerability I'm sorry, of minority and undocumented women by creating more and safe ways to enter Europe and to move between countries. Through opening up the borders, states can reduce the vulnerability of women and the risk of abuse and violence. I ran for the election to the European Parliament because I think change is going too slow. It's even going backwards in many aspects. We have seen hate speech against Roma from several political leaders in Europe. And in the recent parliamentary elections in Sweden, some parties even campaigned to make begging in the streets illegal, clearly targeting the Roma. The far right is taking ownership of the, over the problems of exc exclusion. We need to take back the ownership and call the problems for what they are. They are called racism, anti-gypsies, homophobia, patriarchal, and discrimination. These are the problems that we need to tackle, and it is very urgent. 
when the far right is organizing very well and taking seats in local, national, and European parliaments, we need to do the same. As feminists, we are powerful resistance to the dangerous idea of the far right, of one religion, one nation, one people, one sex, the man with woman as a complement. We will not compromise with equal rights for one group on behalf of another. We need to work jointly against all forms of discrimination and connect the women's movement with the anti-racist movement, LGBT movement, etc. Only then we can succeed. We need to raise the level of ambition in the struggle for democracy and human rights for all. And Roma are European citizen. And, res and the responsibility is, of course, the states and local regional authorities to handle Roma situation just as they do with non-Roma situation. This is not a Europe that I am very proud of, and I will also be getting a little bit stronger. I am ashamed to say that we have a democracy only because we have this election. In the European Parliament today, we have about 100 parliamentarians who are from the far right, extreme right political parties. And we have seen this situation before. So all of us has to take responsibility to make sure that our democracy and our values in political area, in social area, are really founded in human rights values, that all humans are equal and have the equal right for dignity life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Soraya. Thank you for these words and for a powerful testimony of your and your family's personal experience. And I would like to thank you also for giving very many constructive recommendations of things that can still be done and should be done by participating states, by civil society, by the institutions, by, by the OSC, by ODIR. And I would also like to thank you for your reference to the uh, white paper uh, that has been developed and that is going to be presented in a joint side event next week uh, by the Swedish delegation and, and the contact point for Roma and Sinti next week uh, um, on the 30th of September. So thank you very much for your words and for uh, the inspiration to do more and better. Thank you. I would like now to give the floor to our next speaker, Dr. Gemma Hasratian. Please, the floor is yours. Уважаемые дамы и господа, на утреннем заседании были обсуждены проблемы насилия и в отношении женщин, представлены определенные позитивные изменения по преодолению насилия в отношении женщин, а также внесены предложения по дальнейшему улучшению борьбы с насилием, в частности в семье. На данном пленарном заседании, как продолжение начатого утреннего обсуждения, предстоит рассмотреть проблемы насилия в отношении женщин уязвимых групп населения, население, которое по своей природе, насилие, которое по своей природе, форме и проявлениям ничем не отличается от насилия в отношении женщин, происходит ежедневно, однако зачастую по многим причинам остается невидимым для общества. Голоса женщин, принадлежащих к уязвимым группам, национальным меньшинствам, мигрантам, внутренним переселенцам, беженцам, инвалидам, пожилым, проживающим в сельских и отдаленных районах, оказавшихся в зоне вооруженных конфликтов, преимущественно исключены из общественного дискурса. Представление их проблем в средствах массовой информации ограничено, их проблемы, как правило, не учитываются при разработке новых политик и принятии новых законов. Различные интересы и потребности как женщин, так и мужчин уязвимых групп часто упускаются из виду из-за отсутствия системного подхода к решению вопросов неравенства этих групп граждан и насилия в отношении женщин. Во второй статье Всеобщей декларации прав 
человека отмечается, что каждый человек должен обладать всеми правами и всеми свободами, провозглашенными настоящей декларацией, без какого бы то ни было различия, как-то в отношении расы, цвета кожи, пола, языка, религии, политических или иных убеждений, национального или социального происхождения, имущественного, сословного или иного положения». Несмотря на то, что правовая защита национальных меньшинств находится под особым вниманием международного права, национальные меньшинства, проживающие на территории государств, где живут доминант, доминантные этнические группы, сталкиваются с объективными и субъективными сложностями, различными формами дискриминации, непреодоление которых может и зачастую приводит к насильственным действиям в отношении представителей данной этнической группы, угрожает ее существованию и дальнейшему развитию. Нередко дискриминация и насилие по признаку национальной принадлежности сочетается с насилием по гендерному признаку. Нам представляется, что государства, имеющие национальные, религиозные или языковые меньшинства, должны предусматривать определенные дополнительные гарантии для сохранения самобытности национальных меньшинств и исключения возможностей насилия в отношении женщин этой группы. Для эффективной защиты прав национальных меньшинств важное значение имеет также наличие соответствующей институциональной системы, создание специальных структур, советов или комиссий в рамках правительств стран. Одну из уязвимых групп населения представляют женщины-мигранты, которые составляют около 50% мирового населения мигрантов. Это категория женщин, используемая преимущественно, преимущественно в качестве неквалифицированных или домашних работников с небольшим заработком или без дохода и дополнительных преимуществ, причитаемых работникам вообще, часто эксплуатируются как жертвы торговли людьми и остаются вне поля зрения правовой системы. Не имея других лучших альтернатив и нередко законных разрешений на место жительства, именно эта категория женщин часто подвергается трудовой или сексуальной эксплуатации, сексуальному насилию и домогательству. Нередкие случаи, когда их заставляют стать суррогатными матерями, или они сами решают быть ими, пытаясь обеспечить свое проживание, жизнь своих семей. Еще одна проблема. Всемирного э, внимания требует другая уязвимая группа женщин, женщины с ограниченными возможностями, которые часто подвергаются двойной дискриминации, как из-за стереотипных представлений о женщинах вообще, так и об инвалидах. Статистические данные свидетельствуют, что в учреждениях 6 из 10 женщин в течение своей жизни подвергаются физическому или сексуальному насилию, которое является главной причиной смерти и инвалидности среди 16-44-летних женщин. В средстве отсутствия системного подхода к обеспечению равного доступа к правам, в том числе на труд, образование и здравоохранение, женщины-инвалиды становятся не только чрезвычайно уязвимой, но и в большей степени подвергаемой насилию группой. Сегодня совершенно очевидно и другое, что непрекращающиеся войны и различные по масштабам и целям конфликты приводят к, уровню, к росту насилия, несут горе и разочарование миллионам людей, в первую очередь затрагивают женщин и детей. Негативные последствия вооруженных конфликтов сказываются на различных аспектах социально-экономического положения женщин и продолжают существенным образом влиять на благосостояние их семей. Поэтому конфликты не могут рассматриваться как исключительно мужская проблема и мужская сфера деятельности, потому что мир и развитие не только неразрывно связаны с проблемой равенства между мужчинами и женщинами, но и потому, что именно женщины в большей степени испытывают насилие и разрушительные последствия военных конфликтов. Уважаемые участники совещания! Пекинская платформа действий, 20-летие которой будет отмечаться в 2015 году, обозначила необходимость пропаганды ненасильственных форм разрешения конфликтов и повышения роли женщин в таких направлениях, как поддержание мира и превентивная дипломатия.
Резолюция 1325 Совета безопасности ООН о женщинах, мире и безопасности от 31 октября 2000 года рекомендует более широкое вовлечение женщин во все аспекты предотвращения, управления и разрешения конфликтов и нацелено на обеспечение безопасности женщин и девочек во время конфликтов. Резолюция призывает все стороны вооруженных конфликтах принимать специальные меры для защиты женщин и девочек от обусловленного половой принадлежностью насилия, особенно от изнасилования и других форм сексуального надругательства и всех других форм насилия. Особо отмечается также, что все государства несут ответственность за то, чтобы положить конец беззаконно, беззаконию и осуществлять судебное преследование лиц, виновных в геноциде, преступлениях против человечества и военных преступлениях, включая преступления, касающиеся сексуального и других форм насилия в отношении женщин и девочек. Проблема насилия самым непосредственным образом затрагивает женщин-беженцев и внутренних переселенцев, которые продолжают оставаться одной из наиболее уязвимых социальных групп, недостаточно интегрированных в местное общество и нуждающихся в особом внимании со стороны государств, неправительственного сектора и международных организаций. Не всегда ведется учет гендерной составляющей занятости беженцев, отсутствует система льгот для одиноких либо престарелых женщин при получении жилья, распределение гуманитарной помощи, медицинского обслуживания. Общая рекомендация 27 Конвенции ООН о ликвидации всех форм дискриминации в отношении женщин признает, что хотя мужчины и женщины одинаково страдают от дискриминации, однако неравенство и дискриминация, которые подвергаются женщины на протяжении всей жизни, усугубляются в старости. В соответствии с заявлением от 2012 года специального докладчика по вопросу о насилии в отношении женщин, его причинах и последствиях, отмечено, пожилые женщины, по всей вероятности, будут одинокими, учитывая, что они вступают в брак в более молодом возрасте и что они не обязательно вступают в повторный брак после смерти мужа или развода. Важно принять это во внимание при решении проблем, стоящих перед пожилыми женщинами, так как вдовство или развод развод в некоторых контекстах могут быть источником и действительно становится источником дискриминации и насилия, тем самым ужесточая дискриминацию, с которой сталкиваются пожилые люди, независимо от их возраста. Необходимо, на наш взгляд, расширить права уязвимых групп женщин, создавать соответствующие условия и возможности их реализации в различных областях, начиная от образования, в том числе образования в области прав человека, расширение экономических прав и их включение в общественную и политическую жизнь. Только таким образом правительство и гражданское общество могут гарантировать, что нужды и заботы уязвимых групп женщин станут частью повседневной политики и принятия решений в странах-участницах. Это может быть достигнуто только путем укрепления правовых основ, предотвращающих дискриминацию по признаку пола, всеоблемающего учета потребностей и возможностей женщин и мужчин, интеграции гендерной составляющей во все государственные стратегии и политики. Рассматривая проблему уязвимых групп женщин, ставших жертвами насилия, мы также должны иметь в виду необходимость выявления как незарегистрированных случаев насильственных действий, так и трудностей, связанных со сбором более полной информации, ибо стало обычным явлением, когда нарушение прав и насилие в отношении женщин этой группы, в частности женщин-мигрантов и женщин, пребывающих в тюрьмах, остаются скрытыми и незарегистрированными. Еще одним, по нашему мнению, необходимым условием, без которого в конечном счете все эти политики не будут иметь никакого эффекта, является включение самих представителей маргинальных групп женщин в разработку политики в их отношении. Государства-участники, конечно, защищают эти группы женщин за счет институциональных систем и через систему юстиции, но важнее наделять женщин уязвимых групп навыками и возможностями, чтобы они сами могли защитить себя от насилия и дискриминации, активно участвовать во всех сферах жизни, как можно активнее и полнее через представленность на всех уровнях системы управления и принятия решений.
Для повышения эффективности всего комплекса мер по защите прав человека женщин важно сосредоточиться на целостном и стратегическом подходе, позволяющем бороться с многообразными формами дискриминации, которым подвергаются женщины из уязвимых групп. Насилие в отношении женщин маргинальных групп не может оставаться безнаказанным. Виновные должны быть привлечены к ответственности, а жертвы должны получить эффективную защиту и поддержку. Правительство и общественные организации должны придерживаться основных принципов московского документа 1991 года, призывающего государств участников ОБСЕ ликвидировать все формы насилия в отношении женщин. Это в полной мере относится к уязвимым группам женщин, мигрантам, внутренним переселенцам, беженцам, женщинам с ограниченными возможностями, пожилым женщинам, женщинам, пребывающим в тюрьмах. Обсуждение проблемы и рекомендации данного совещания призваны способствовать формированию и реализации правительствами и общественными организациями комплекса мер, направленных на предотвращение всех форм насилия в отношении женщин. Благодарю за внимание. Gemma, for uh, such a clear and in-depth analysis of the challenges that women who belong to vulnerable groups have to face, and for taking us through uh, many of the different uh, initiatives taken place at the international level to remind us of the work that it is left ahead of us. And thank you also uh, for the recommendations that you have issued in your statement to guide us through uh, the next steps that uh, need to be taken to make that situation change. So thank you uh, to our two introducers today. I would like now to um, open the floor for um, comments from uh, participants. Um, I have 11 requests for the floor, so we are given five minutes for each one of those interventions. The list remains open if anybody else would like to sign. So the first um, in my list is um, the representative of Canada, followed uh, by the USA. Canada. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, and uh, allow me first to thank our two introducers for having shared their experiences uh, and their expertise uh, uh, with us and for uh, highlighting the serious uh, challenges that uh, remain to be addressed. Uh, Madam Moderator, the promotion and protection of the rights of women and girls is a priority for the Government of Canada. And as we stated during yesterday's discussions, discrimination against women and girls is one of the main barriers to the realization of their basic human rights, to achieve sustainable development, and is a structural driver of violence against women and girls. In addition to being a strong supporter of UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace and security, including through our own 2010 National Action Plan on this issue, Canada has led the Violence Against Women Resolution at the UN Human Rights Council for the past two decades. The 2014 resolution at HRC 26 focused on violence as a, bar a barrier to women's political and economic empowerment. Women and girls are often targeted because they are among the most vulnerable members of their community. Among many other aspects, the resolution recognizes that, marginalized in their own communities, indigenous women and girls, women and girls with disabilities, older women, migrants and minorities often experience multiple forms of discrimination which may increase their vulnerability to all forms of violence and limit their ability to participate in, contribute to and enjoy economic, social, cultural and political autonomy. Madam Moderator, Canada, like all other OSC participating states, is not immune to the serious challenges posed by violence and discrimination against women belonging to vulnerable groups. Last week, the Government of Canada released an action plan on family violence and violent crimes against Aboriginal women and girls. The plan is putting to work the $25 million the Government announced in 2014 and is part of a $200 million, uh, $200 million investment in a range of measures to address violence against Aboriginal women and girls. The plan sets out concrete action to prevent violence, support Aboriginal victims, and protect Aboriginal women and girls from violence. Internationally, Canada has played a leadership role in raising awareness of and taking action towards ending child, early, and forced marriage. Together with Zambia and a core group of countries, we will introduce a resolution on the issue at the UN General Assembly again this year, and we call on all OSC participating states to join us with their support. 
The OSC is a regional security organization, and Canada believes it must play an important role in supporting and implementing relevant UN resolutions, in advancing our joint OSC commitments, and in leading by example when it comes to tackling violence and discrimination against women. Last year's addendum to the Action Plan on Combating Trafficking in Human Beings must also give renewed impetus to our efforts to combat a crime that disproportionately, disproportionately affects women and girls. OSC participating states must speak out against violence against women, including sexual and gender-based violence in conflict and emergency situations, regardless of whether this crime takes place within or outside the OSC region. Canada was honored to participate in the June Global Summit to End Sexual Violence in London and to com contribute to the fight against this grievous affront to human dignity. Madam Moderator, since my delegation did not take the floor during the morning session on combating domestic violence, would also like to take this opportunity to state that there should be no doubt as to the commitment of the Government of Canada and of Canadians to end domestic violence. We are tackling this problem through long-standing national and regional initiatives to stop family violence and through grassroots initiatives, such as the now global White Ribbon Campaign to help men educate boys and promote healthy and equal relationships between women and men, girls and boys. Before concluding, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Moderator, uh, three recommendations uh, from uh, my delegation for this session are, uh, number one, for OSC participating states to unequivocally condemn violence and discrimination against women in all its forms, notably violence against women belonging to vulnerable groups. Second, for OSC participating states to fully recognize the relevance and benefits to our collective security of implementing the most fundamental elements of the UN resolutions on women, peace and security, and to reflect this in relevant OSC decisions and ensure that women are not only in the room, but at the head table of all decision-making processes. And third recommendation, for the OSC and its institutions, including field operations, to assist participating states in developing policies programs, and training to address the issue of violence and discrimination against women in all its forms. I thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, pass now on the floor to the delegate of uh, the representative of the United States of America to be followed by Switzerland. Sir. Well, thank you very much, and I, I want to thank the introducers as well for being so explicit about the issues and the problems and the solutions. And Soraya Post, I thank you for uh, getting involved in the political process because it's very, very important uh, be of, because of what you represent. And uh, it's a very powerful message that you have for us. I, uh, this, this issue uh, is something that I have researched. Uh, there, I have had a colleague at the university who's done a lot of field research in this area, and I think it would shock people uh, the extent to which rape is used as a weapon of war. Uh, it's certainly been used despite uh, agreements at ministerial meetings here of the OSCE that we would take all necessary steps to prevent this kind of violence against women and girls. Uh, it, of course, would totally violate the Geneva Conventions uh, on war, and uh, unfortunately, we see an increase in this. We see it now in the Middle East uh, with the ISIS or ISIL forces. Uh, I came across a story that was uh, confirmed uh, that in Syria, for example, there was a, a man taken uh, as a prisoner to coerce information from him, his uh, mother, his w sister, and a neighbor were taken into the prison and raped in front of him. This is just an explicit, obviously, a descri uh, description. It's difficult to comprehend, but I think it's important for us to get these stories out there so that people understand what is being done. Um, now, my country has done uh, quite a bit in the Obama administration on this issue. S several of the things that have been done under the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security are part of an overall strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence uh, globally. And many of the actions which are detailed here in my statement are fully consistent with what has been recommended by the introducers. 
What's important about these, these initiatives called the Accountability Initiative, the Safe from the Start program, which funds NGO efforts uh, to respond to gender-based violence in humanitarian emergencies, um, the money that we've provided to the, centers for, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, their Violence Against Children surveys, is the collection of data that, uh, that basically holds people accountable for these problems. Another survey tool is offered by um, a program called Together for Girls, which helps countries undertake comprehensive surveys uh, to document the magnitude, nature, and effects of physical, emotional, and sexual violence against children uh, with a focus on girls. And we're putting a great deal of money into a commitment to the Gender-Based Violence Emergency Response and Protection Initiative. We're also updating visa policies and guidance to ensure that uh, even those in the highest echelons of the military or government who order, engage, ensure that even, uh, uh, or look the other way when their subordinates commit acts of sexual violence will not be able uh, to travel to the United States. I know that the OSCE has been an international leader in this in assuring that its own field missions are part of the solution and not part of the problem. Um, I don't think we could underscore enough how serious this is, particularly at a time when there is uh, violence and uh, combat and war uh, within the OSCE region. So I think it's extraordinarily important for us to continue to collect information, to do training, uh, to make people much more aware of the serious problem that we're facing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. In the list is, uh, is Switzerland, uh, to be followed by Pavy Point Travelers Center. Switzerland. Merci, Madame la Modératrice. Ce matin, nous avons parlé de comment la violence domestique affecte les femmes et les enfants et de ce que l'OSCE et ses États participants peuvent faire pour y mettre fin. Ceci dit, bien que cette grave violation des droits de l'homme affecte toutes les couches de la société, certaines femmes et certains enfants y sont bien plus exposés que d'autres. Il s'agit des femmes et des enfants appartenant à des groupes vulnérables et marginalisés. Dans la décision ministérielle 15.5 au sujet de la prévention et de la lutte contre la violence à l'égard des femmes, les États participants avaient, il y a presque dix ans, exprimé leurs graves préoccupations face à la situation de ces femmes et enfants exposés à des multiples formes de violence et discrimination en temps de paix comme en situation de conflit. En cette année anniversaire des dix ans du plan d'action de l'OSCE sur les questions d'égalité, la présidence suisse appelle les États participants à soutenir la décision ministérielle proposée à ce sujet. La session d'hier ainsi que cette journée spéciale sur le sujet de la violence contre les femmes et les enfants ont souligné la nécessité pour renforcer l'égalité et éradiquer la violence à leur égard. Par rapport à la violence contre les femmes dans les conflits armés, la Suisse a mis à jour son plan d'action national relatif à la mise en œuvre de la résolution 1325 du Conseil de sécurité de l'ONU en 2013. Le plan contient de, des mesures concrètes permettant de soutenir les femmes et les filles et d'atténuer les répercussions des conflits armés à leur égard. En Suisse, nous essayons d'adresser les causes profondes de la violence plutôt qu'uniquement ses symptômes. Cela implique qu'on se concentre sur la prévention de la violence, notamment en combattant la pauvreté et la marginalisation, et en promouvant l'intégration des femmes et des enfants. Nous avons mis en place un programme de lutte contre les mariages forcés. Des mesures législatives ont été introduites et sont accompagnées par un programme de prévention et de conseil aux victimes. Dans plusieurs pays, les mariages précoces restent à l'ordre du jour. Nous considérons l'OSCE comme un forum adéquat pour renforcer les efforts et mettre fin à cette pratique 
qui constitue une grave violation des droits des femmes. Comme nous avons eu l'occasion de le mentionner à l'occasion de la Gender Review Conference du mois de juillet à travers l'envoyé spécial de la Suisse pour l'agenda de développement durable post-2015, la Suisse s'engage sur tous les plans pour un, pour un objectif sur l'égalité de genre dans le futur agenda de développement. Nous sommes convaincus qu'un tel objectif spécifique ainsi que la réflexion des aspects relatifs à l'égalité de genre dans les autres objectifs pourront contribuer de manière significative à l'élimination de la discrimination et de la violence à l'égard des femmes dans les années à venir. Il est fondamental que les buts relatifs à l'égalité de genre soient formulés en considérant les femmes et les filles les plus vulnérables et marginalisées. Je vous remercie, Madame la modératrice. Merci beaucoup. Next in my list is um, Pavy Point Travelers Center to be followed by Azerbaijan. Please go ahead. Um, Pavy Point welcomes the opportunity to highlight some of the issues that Roma and traveler women face in relation to violence against women in Ireland. Firstly, it is important to note that domestic and sexual violence affects women from all social and ethnic groups. Violence is not part of the traveler and Roma culture. The experience of violence against women in the travel and Roma culture are largely based by the intersection of discrimination based on ethnicity, gender, class, immigration status, state policies and practices. Together these factors exacerbate the violence Roma and travel women face and create barriers to disclosing, reporting and leaving violent situations. In the vast majority of cases, violence against Roma and travel women goes unreported and women are forced to stay in situations of violence. There is little comprehensive and reliable data about the experience of violence against women among traveller and Roma, or their experiences in serious services due to lack of disaggregated data by ethnicity. The UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women and the UN Human Rights Committee have urged the Irish state to engage in systematic and comprehensive data collection on violence against women and systematically monitor and evaluate its components, particularly in relation to vulnerable and marginalised women, including migrant and traveller women. It is important to note that to date the state has fallen short of these commitments. The UN Human Rights Committee has identified significant financial and administrative obstacles to access support services for mar marginalised women. The committee has urged the state to take further legislative as well as policy measures to ensure that all women, particularly women from vulnerable and marginalised groups, have equal access to protection. The committee notes how the habitual residence condition poses a serious obstacle for traveller and Roma women to seek exit 